how to invent a religion. I always knew you had to be willing to die to even do this job. You can't stop what to come. Executive orders. The creation and the maintenance of a secret government within our government. It's a wrong the war with anything. I feel like you won't stand right to rip your face off. There's something wrong with everything. I was so spun. What's the most you ever lost in the coin toss? The law of the jungle. Sir. The most you ever lost in the coin toss. You don't know what you're talking about. There's something I said. I said, you don't know what you're talking about. Suppression of unrest and dissent. Oh man, it's good to be back. Rolly Quaid has returned. No more waiting nor grieving. I am back in the saddle right here on revisionmedia.org. And I got a big show for you tonight. And I got a special guest, of course. No other than Dean Hartwell. Dean, are you there? Oh yeah. Man, it's great to have you on my show. I've read three of your books. I know that you um, wrote several books. You're one of my favorite working writers, and I really enjoy and loved your books. Thank you. Which one have you read most recently? Last night I read was 9-11 a movie, and also the second edition of Plane Without Passengers is another good one. Oh, thank you. I want to... I haven't quite finished Mythology 9-11, but I've been really meaning to um, get around it. Um, your books are so excellent. Um, they're, they're right around $5. I think that uh, was 9-11, a movie was 12 I mean, it's, it's not that expensive. You know, it's a bargain, but still, it's stock full of great information, in my personal opinion, and it's a great read-through. You could read through these books in about an hour or two, and... I temporarily temporarily made notes um, when reading itself, and you can make shows based on your books. Right. You know, I tried to do that on Facebook. I tried to put some mini movies, like one-minute movies together, putting together pictures of some people involved, it's like Betty Ong, for example, and David Angel, and did doing um, captions, which explain who they were and then what their role was. I especially got involved with that for the mythology book because I thought there were a lot of characters like those two and others. But yeah, I, I like the idea too. Yeah, there's been a lot of thought police, and especially in the 9 11 truth community, um, we kind of police ourselves. You know, um, there's been a lot of people telling me to, why don't you ask Dean about Betty Ong? You know, her, her family testify at the 9 11 commission, you know, so that's proof, you know, that full thread of Betty Ong. That thing was a total sham, the 9-11 commission. It was. (laughs) It's been done before. I mean, look at the Warren Commission. I've read through that a couple times, and it, it too, was a sham, just designed to cover up and not get to the truth. So, yeah, sure, our, our government's done it before. They'll do it again. We got Phil Zelikow. Uh, did you know that Phil Zelikow, who was actually the leader of the 9-11 Commission, it really wasn't Keynes, but did you know that he did a movie that was based on a, that based on a JFK book? It was called 13 Days. Did you know that um, that book was based on his research? No, I didn't know that. I, I've enjoyed the book, and I remember the movie as well. I think uh, Kevin Costner was in it, but uh, no, I didn't know the connection with Zelikow. So there, it's so painfully obvious, and you've wrote about the JFK assassination before. Anybody who covers up for JFK, you're going to think automatically with the 9-11 Commission that he's going to cover up as well, obfuscate truths and realities of what happened, don't you think? I think so. I didn't have any confidence in the 9-11 Commission, and I remember that uh, the Bush administration didn't even want a commission to begin with. They had to be pressured to it. But uh, no, I, I didn't have any confidence in it. 
commissions. I mean, they could be controlled. Like, look, look back again to the Warren Commission, where the the people on the commission would not allow uh, Oswald's family or Oswald's attorney to have any say. So it's just like a prosecutor saying, here are all the terrible things about Oswald, and they didn't get half of it right anyway. And uh, you don't hear another side of the story. You don't hear any cross-examination. You don't have anybody who didn't agree with the official theory allowed to give uh, any input. So, yeah, it's very fixed ahead of time. Very easy for them to do. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it was the New Jersey girls, these four wives that husbands had died during 9-11 that prompted the investigation to begin with. And it was originally going to be Henry Kissinger leading the investigation. And the New Jersey girls in a meeting um, told Henry Kissinger, like, explain your Saudi connections. And he almost spilled his coffee right on the ground. <laughs> so it became Zadikow's, um craft to erect public mythology itself it was his given job he's another agent smith to keep us in this locked matrix where just everything is a lie itself and we're just like locked inside of a harvest pool itself and we don't even know about our surroundings it's it's like the shadows and the, the allegory of the shadows almost it seems like in this insulated world we live in where everything is a lie. Yeah, it's, it starts out that way. I remember the day of 9-11. I walk into work, and there's TV sets on, which is totally unusual where I work. And there's people glued to the screens. And there's already people screaming about those terrorists, those Arabs, those Muslims, and so on and so forth. And uh, I didn't really harbor... Um, you know, let's say an opposing view or uh, opposition to the official view for a while, maybe about four years. But I remember during those early days, I mean, if you even suggested that there weren't 19 hijackers or that um, if you suggested that Bin Laden didn't do it, I mean, you would have been harangued. You've been run out of town. And it just starts out with that kind of fear. And we never really get over it as a society, I don't think. And there's still people that they probably know that the official theory is a hoax, that it makes no sense, but they're going to support it anyway. They don't really know any better. You do strike me as a stoic. You seem like somebody who's very calm and collective and like to bring your thoughts together in a way. <laughs> I, wish, <laughs> I, I wish I could be that way. I'm kind of a blurter out, and I got no filter. I just say what I'm thinking as I'm thinking it all the time. But it's interesting. You brought up the point that you came into work and people are already talk about them, Muslim terrorists, like it's the whole collective of the entire Muslim world itself. And these people, like the common people, you know, um, they're usually hitting the snooze buttons on their conscious and they're just in a sleep lab itself. And they're just not really aware of anything um, that's going on geopolitically. It's just really what's confined in their day-to-day -day work and their grind and their overwhelm, overwork, in most cases underpaid. I got to tell you, though, like um, there's an age gap between me and you. And I was a kid when 9-11 happened itself. I'm a millennial. And uh, I was in school. And I was in a very southern Baptist town on the Bible Belt. Okay. And my parents are college professors. And they commute to work. And everybody around me is a farmer, right? Right. So, so <laughs> um, they finally put TVs in our school. They didn't have that before. And we did this thing called home room where it's like you go to this one room and we sat all day and we watched these TVs all day long. And it was, it was a shock for me just to watch TV because my parents didn't let us watch TV growing up, you know, living in the Bible Belt. Oh, yeah. I, so I, I, we I had grandparents out that way. Yeah. So like, uh, so it was a real experience for me to be able to watch the news. My dad always listened to Rush Limbaugh in the morning when we were um, riding to school, which smelled of manure. So I'm smelling full <laughs> <laughs> while I listen to Rush Limbaugh. And unfortunately, I think um, that's how I got my start. Like in talk radio was I always wanted to impress my dad. But I got to tell you, I don't agree with the official establishment version whatsoever. No, no, um, I can picture this. Um, I spent some time in 
East Texas. So I know the culture of the Bible Belt and uh, love the people there. Um, but just like it is with the people that I encountered shortly after 9-11, there's just one point of view. And you don't dare challenge it, not not out loud. <laughs> It'll be, people You'd be at my a bad workplace. Christian if you did. Dean. Oh. <laughs> well, you're with the devil if you say a, a word, naughty word about uh, the Bible or Christianity, just like you're a, a bad citizen or a bad patriot. Um, if you were to suggest, as I now suggest or say, that bin Laden didn't do it, for example. But if I had said that back then at my workplace, I mean, come on. It wasn't going to be a good thing for me. And there's still people at my workplace and elsewhere that that's to kind of give me a, a jive. They kind of tease me, although um, I think there's always an ounce of intent in teasing. They, you know, they call me a conspiracy theorist or this or that. You know, it just never goes away. You've been stigmatized and branded. You might as well just oh, yeah. say everything you believe, you know, at this uh, point. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to give you credit, though. You're a professional person, and there's just not, a not, not enough professional people speaking out for poor people, you know, whatsoever. And that's why we got this terminally ill, corrupt society that we have right now is that the watchmen are not guarding their pastures. And when the pasture and the sheep watcher falls asleep, you know, um, the wolves take over the pasture itself and you need people conscious and aware of what's going around. You just don't need a bunch of um, people that are smart enough just to clock in and just smart enough to do the job. You need people that are aware of everything. And that includes in the realm of politics. Oh, yeah. It's never going to be a situation where 100% of society or even close to that are going to be participating. I mean, that would be pure democracy. Everybody's involved. Everybody's voting on every last thing. It's, it's never going to be like that at all. And I don't know what the percentage is. I think sometimes it's like 10%. 10% to know 90% of what's going on. Like 10% in an organization do 90% of the work. It just, we just seem to lapse into that because I think a lot of people just assume other people are going to do their thinking, the heavy lifting, the critical analysis. And a lot of people just say, no, nope, not for me. I, I can't do that. Too bad. Compartmentalization. Leslie Grove coined the term, you know. Um, he actually helped build the Pentagon, he actually turned the spade. On September the 11th, 1941. Did you know that? No. That, that's when How they broke the ground for uh, the Pentagon was on September the 11th, 1941. You know, that's been a really horrible date. Uh, I think that was the date that uh, the uh, leader of uh, Chile, uh, Allende, was murdered. And it's also the date that uh, George H.W. Bush started talking about the New World Order. Kind of weird. Yeah. I, I have a kind of interest in numerology. It's something that's more intuitive, not something I really can study or explain. But numbers are just, they have something to do with this. Numbers definitely have something to do with their psyche. And Bush Sr. definitely made his announcement of a new world order ruled by the UN. And essentially, to the effect, make a one world government on September the 11th, 1990. And it's a shame. Most people actually misquoted it as being 1991 that he actually made that pronouncement, but it was actually 1990. And I think that 11 year is more significant than a decade, you know, because 11, you know. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. But your books, I really love, and I want to start diving into it because it's the voice of insanity and an otherwise echo chamber of insanity itself. And <laughs> I, I think that 9-11 is a memento of the power of Big Brother's power of perception over us. And is it possible that they could pull off 9-11 without using any planes? Do they have that much perception control over us? Yes. And the reason I say that ties back to what I said a, a little while ago about going into work and learning about 9-11 by watching TV screens. It just for five minutes, I got the story 
because they kept playing that uh, second plane as it was smashing into the tech. I don't think uh, I could hear Dean. Dean, are you are you still there? Richard, are we having um Hey Rolly, you and I are still yeah. here. Dean may need to reconnect. Okay. Let's just keep talking until we get him to reconnect. Um what do you think about all this that we've said so far, Richard? Well, there's some interesting theories, Rolly. I mean, there are a lot of variations out there as far as whether or not there were even planes. Uh, some say that you can see an image of the plane passing back out the other side, indicating it was CGI. Of course, other people just point out how a relatively hollow aluminum frame would not even penetrate the towers when you look at the difference in just the sort of structure it, it would be similar to taking the tower like a baseball bat and swinging it at the plane you know the same effect um, and basically that plane should have crunched up more like a can is the way some describe it so as far as it even penetrating completely that it is something i find curious and then, of course, well, there were a lot of um, companies with special access the days and, well, the couple of weeks just before the incident. Plenty of time to place enough charges, detonation charges, cutter charges in the building. That was oh. definitely a factor in my opinion. But Hello? It, we have someone else who it joined here. We got an unknown caller. Hello, unknown soldier. How are you doing? Rolly Quaid, I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to contact Dean Hartwell so you can get him back on so it won't interfere with your conference. Yeah, absolutely. I tried to get him on Facebook, but I couldn't. Um, thank you so very much for doing that for me, sir. I will do it. 9-11, 9-11 in my opinion, Richard, was a Hollywood style movie production complete with actors, including firefighters and eyewitness and had C oh, it had CGI um, composited and there were cinematic effects to it. You know, how do we know like the footage that we saw of nine 11 wasn't in fact, you know, um, doctored itself. We didn't see any images of the impact of the Pentagon until 2006, five years after the fact. And all we saw was two security cams at the Pentagon. And this is like the most guarded facility of all. And all we saw was two security cams and then a sicko cam, you know, the gas station that patrons and workers of the Pentagon went to. And there was an Arlington Hotel so there was only four places that we actually saw images of the impact of the Pentagon, and they were unreliable. We really didn't see much whatsoever. We just saw the after effect itself. And we've had conflicting stories on whether or not the planes were hijacked even including what Dean has had to say in his books, whether there were people on the planes. So, I don't know, some suggest that this was remotely operated. You know, no humans were aboard such planes. I don't know. What have you been leaning toward recently, Rolly? Well, if you ask me, am I a no-planer, I would say no, because... I'm of the opinion that I cannot make a determination whether there was impact on the towers or not in particular because the footage that we saw was manipulated. And I really hate and dredge the term no planer itself. This really started with the pioneer of 9-11 blog itself. His name was Holmgrim's. 
And he was blogging before really anybody else and influenced so many people. And he's just in the dustbin of history. But he's one of these guys like Bill Cooper, for example, that just knew that 9-11 was an inside job and immediately got to work. And he was so influential to the 9-11 community. And he's only talked about backlogs of forums and stuff like that. He influenced like David Ray Griffin. He used him as a source in his book, you know, the new Pearl Harbor itself. He was, I can't, I can imagine him being even influenced to Christopher Berlin and the average consumer of 9-11 material has no idea who this great man is. And he's just such an influential uh, mind itself. And he thought that 9-11 was not a hologram, you know, like a pepper ghost. That's something that John Lear has been approaching for 9-11, uh, pilots for 9-11 truth. Yeah, I don't I don't think it was a pepper ghost um, itself because you would need a source for that in order for it to be a hologram to seek into it. And also uh, David Shaler um, promoted that idea who was very, very connected to Julian Assange and his wife to... Um, Amy Amy McIntyre, I forget her last name, always slaughter that. But uh, yeah, and it just doesn't seem like a hologram would be feasible. And, you know, uh, Shaler himself was a part of MI6. He, you know, he supposedly um, left the organization, but did he really sort of thing? Yeah, so like I cannot make an educated decision whether I think that 9-11 was in fact done with a plane or remote control. That is highly possible itself that it was done with a remote control plane or even a cruise missile itself. Have you ever seen uh, the JSM uh, missiles that kind of look like a plane with, uh, with wings on top of it? May, may I interject? Absolutely, caller. What do what should we call you? Why don't I call me the ghost? Hi, ghost. How you doing, sir? Uh, well, let's talk about the conspiracies that aren't talked about. Hit me. What you got? Well, what do you know about Zia Jara, supposedly the pilot for flight United Airlines Flight ninety three? Are you going to go into ghost plane? What's that? Are you going to start talking about Ghost Plane um, Flight One Seventy Five being a CGI? Well, what, right. Well, what, why would why would you why would you automatically dismiss it as a Ghost Plane? That's what they've been calling it. I think Ace Baker coined that term. What would you call it? And, uh, I, and your United, name is Ghost. I thought that's where you're going to go. Yeah, United Airlines Flight Ninety Three. We'll call it. The conspiracy is not the plane. The conspiracy is who wasn't in the plane. And the real conspiracy involves him. Because if you look at the background of Ziad Jara, you'll know that there was an Israeli intelligence behind him. And if you dismiss him and you dismiss the people who called the plane, and by the way, the irony is, is that six people called on that plane, and it was the 9-11 Commission that said that there were four hijackers. Well, six calls were made in that plane, and they all said there was three. It's also asserted that the transcript recorder survived, which is pretty important because at the bottom of the transcript, there's a person sitting next to the pilot. And the person actually said, Saeed, put the plane up, down, up, down. Now, there was a Saeed Al Ghamdi on that plane, but he wasn't supposed to be the pilot. So, without the original flight manifest produced by the 9 11 Commission or the FAA or the FBI, in fact, I put in a Freedom of Information request regarding all four planes. And so did John Masseria, if you're familiar with that name. And we were both rebuffed. And that's because we don't know who got on that plane. We do know there were Saudi hijackers on that plane, but that's about it. But if you dig a little bit deeper regarding the pilots, you'll see that there's a lot of question marks regarding at least two of them, Mohammed Atta and Ziad Jara. Why do I say Ziad Jara? Well, just a couple of years ago, his uncle just got arrested. His uncle, Ali al Jara. Who's Ali al Jara? Well, 
an Israeli spy for 35 years in Lebanon. But because you don't believe in hijackers and you don't believe in planes and you don't believe in calls, none of these people existed. And therefore, the, one of the biggest conspiracies that you can link to the Israeli intelligence has now disappeared. Are you That's familiar? With, are you are you familiar with my blog site, uh, rollyquade.com? I am indeed. Can you send me that information as soon as you can? I will indeed. In fact, I'll uh, send it to you uh, through Messenger, if you wish. It, and you can add either, me on me- you, you can actually add me on Messenger, and I'll tell you my real name. Isn't it obvious like our country itself is a pay-for-play system, and our politicians just serve the benefactors, and who's the biggest lobby and most powerful lobby in, in it, Washington yeah, I, right I now? I absolutely agree with you. In fact, we, we came off on the wrong foot earlier. My name is Adam Fitzgerald. And I will tell you that we don't disagree much. And I think uh, we allowed, well, I did. I was very condescending, but I apologize for it. But I, I do get exasperated when the people that we mentioned before that are the talking points for the truth movement are allowing these ridiculous theories to blanket the real conspiracy. I, listen, I'm telling you right now, I'm not an official report uh, uh, regurgitator. That's the biggest conspiracy of all. And I'll tell you that right now. You can go on my Facebook page and you can take a look. I post every single day about 9-11. It is the biggest conspiracy of all. But when you have whack job conspiracies that blanket the real conspiracies involving Israeli intelligence, Saudi intelligence, Pakistani, and the United States, I mean, the real conspiracies, they told you at the 9-11 Commission. They told you at the Joint House Inquiry. They lied on the spot. Rice. Tenant, Kofor Black, Dale Watson, all these people lied. But if you don't, if you're just going to say and generalize that the whole commission is corrupt, well, that's not necessarily true. Some of those people actually told the truth. Richard Clark was one. All right. Uh, Robin Mueller, uh, uh, Michael Hayden was the director of the NSA. They talked to Louis Free. They talked to a lot of people. And yes, I agree. I wholeheartedly agree with you that the, the government that we have today, Democratic, Republican, bipartisan. Adam, I don't know what's going on tonight. Um, Can you hear him, Richard? Hello? Is Richard there anymore? He's gone. I guess it's just me and you. Yeah, Yeah, Rolly. I can hear both of you. Fine. I can't hear Adam at all. You can't? Now now I can. I, I don't know what happened. Um, I didn't. I didn't hear you until like the last no, thirty uh, well, seconds. I, I'll, I'll, I'll just re- yeah. Well, what I said was I, I. I agree with you wholeheartedly that the government that we have today is corrupt from the top down, from the House to the Senate, right to the the lower level floors of each state. However, with that being said, it's the people, not them, that we allow ourselves to be corrupt and manipulated by these people who lie to us, and not just them. Mm-hmm. We got people who are working for them, who are affiliated with them, and we're too busy not fighting them. That's what we should be fighting against. Oh, I think you got Hartwell back. Yeah, we got Hartwell. Hey, Dean, I'm sorry. We had a little bit of breakup in between the call. We have Adam um, Fitzgerald with us. Would you like to say hi to Adam real quick before he? Hello, Adam. um, Good, Good evening, Mr. Hartwell. I will tell you right now. This is your show, so I'll bow out if you want. And uh, continue listening. Thank you so very much for um, coming on, Adam. I actually appreciate it, uh, especially we were caught in limbo and I needed somebody to talk to while I was doing technical things. No, no problem. Look, you know, I, I'll, uh, even though I think we disagree on certain things, that's okay. Um, but I will, I will t- I'll bow out, but I'll send you that information uh, to your Facebook. I'll add you if you want. I- I'm going to leave, leave a closing thought with you before I get back to Dean real quick, Adam. Yeah, sure. I think, that, that uh, your your approach to 9-11 is probably actually the easiest for people to digest. Um, I think that oh, Dean I, is, I would I would just, I hate to interrupt, but I would disagree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. We'll, we'll talk about it later. Let's get Dean back sure. on the show. And we'll, we'll okay. definitely um, stay um, professional and um, friendly to each other for now on online. Yeah, no, not a problem. Not a problem. So go ahead. Uh, have, have a great show, and I'll be listening. All right, Dean. Um, are you on cell phone now, or were you uh, able to link yeah, in back? Cell phone. I was able to connect okay. back on. Yeah. You know. 
I'm just, am I, do you hear me clearly? Yeah, I hear you actually a lot better than when you were using the computer now. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, it, it kind of sucks because there was a good flow going on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, well. I wonder if someone's I, uh, trying to sabotage this. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I was getting into a little bit about um, Gerald Holmgren. Uh, that's somebody I, I think that you um, are fairly familiar with. You used him as a source one in oh, yeah. one of your books. Definitely. How, how, how did you come across him? I just doing a deep dive, I guess you could say, of all things uh, 9-11. And I ran across his name when I was uh, studying about the planes and I'm learning about the BTS, the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. I'm a, I'm a bureaucrat by nature or by profession, so I'm always looking for official records, especially records that are uh, collected contemporaneous to the events in question. And the BTS is uh, probably the best source to determine what planes took off, especially when we're talking about uh, passenger commercial flights. And uh, I read that uh, Gerard Holmgren, um, back in 2003, just two years after 9-11, obviously, had um, found the information or had recorded information about uh, the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, noting that two of the flights that were said to be involved on 9-11, American Airlines 11 and 77, did not actually take off that day. And he very alertly recorded that. He kept that saved because this was very important because the following year, uh, somebody, uh, whether it was the Bureau of Transportation Statistics or some other authority, uh, essentially scrubbed those records and replaced uh, all the flights before the alleged flights with a simple statement that uh, they, to the effect that we couldn't get the information on their flight uh, takeoff times, and so on. Uh, this became valuable information. Like I was saying, contemporaneous, contemporaneous information taken by the uh, the authority or the agency involved or the agency responsible for collecting the information. Uh, I uh, have a law degree, and that was a, a big thing uh, in terms of evidence. You can prove something in a court of law in, in part by using business records or government records, but that's the thing the court's going to ask. Uh, who took these, who took the information and when was the information taken down? So I, I, in terms of facts, in terms of evidence, it really doesn't get much better than that to show that two of those flights clearly did not take off. And that's what gave me the idea of planes without passengers. Absolutely. That is amazing that there is no record of these companies to not only having one, but two airplanes that have no records of taking out. And of course, that's Flight 11 and 77. And of course, um, Flight 11, you supposedly smashed into the North Tower first. And then 77 was the missile that hit the Pentagon, as Donald Rumsfeld would say. It, it's it's a- absolutely amazing. Like it, when you study the bureaucracy and all of it, wasn't also Barbara Olson's husband a uh, solicitor general of the United States? Yes, uh, T- Ted Olson. He, at the time of 9-11, he was a solicitor general of the United States, a uh, very high-ranking position. And he went on television later in that, that evening saying that he had gotten phone calls from his wife, Barbara Olson, who, of course, was a familiar television personality, a political uh, talk show persona. And, uh, yes, she was said to be on Flight 77. So, I mean, it started to get really fishy there. you got these two planes that clearly didn't take off, and there are other reasons why they didn't take off. But, I mean, it is, like I said, it doesn't get much better than what Gerard Holmgren was able to provide, what he was able to save for uh, other researchers. And then you've got the stuff about Barbara Olson. Uh, she just has this really famous person who was on the plane. Her face kind of gave a face for others, other alleged victims from the flight. And then you got Ted Olson, uh, who argued uh, before the Supreme Court on the Bush versus Gore case. So he was already a well-known person. 
Uh, apparently, somebody that people trusted, <laughs> he went on Larry King, and that's, that was a big thing back then. He, if he had something big to say to the world, you went on Larry King, and that's precisely what Ted Olson did. But again, all this being done through the magic of television, um, I, I in the, that book you were talking about was 9-11 movie, I, I started asking some basic questions, like, who, who drove Barbara Olson to the airport? Um, who picked up the car? Who um, who was waiting with these passengers? Because people could go and wait at the gates for passengers to arrive or depart. Stuff like that I've never heard from anybody. And I put out the question to people on my website. Uh, can, you, can anybody uh, tell me that they drove somebody to the airport on that day uh, that had to do with any of these flights? Never heard a, a word back. But, you know, the magic of television. Barbara Olson, Barbara Olson, Barbara Olson. Her face everywhere all of a sudden. Uh, the victim, and so on and so forth. And people uh, to this day believe it, even though there's no evidence whatsoever that she boarded a flight, let alone Flight 77. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And then you have also another phenomenon with the passengers itself. You have the SSDI, which is the Social Security Death Index. Can you tell us a little bit more about that aspect of 9-11? Well, I got to admit that I made a mistake on the SSDI. At first, I really thought it was uh, something that was there was good evidence that uh, people didn't really get on the flights or didn't really die that day. Um, I took some time, and I think I got it right uh, in the Was 9-11 a Movie book where I say that there, the SSDI, the uh, Social Security Data Index, it is a place um, where names are recorded, the uh, names of deceased persons. But um, just because a person's name doesn't show up in the SSDI doesn't mean they're not dead. There are a, a number of reasons why a person would not be in there. Uh, one being if they have a spouse still around uh, collecting Social Security benefits or kids uh, collecting Social Security benefits, the number is still uh, viable, in which case they cannot be placed on the SSDI. So I just have to admit I made a mistake on that one and um, got it right eventually. I say it just doesn't really help one way or the other. It was interesting, but it doesn't help. Yeah, that was kind of a major talking point in the 2000s was the SSDI uh, talking point for quite some time, and it has kind of faded away in the wind. And you write even in the book that it's only 85% accurate itself. And um, there was only about like 20% that was uh, searchable in the database during 9-11. Is that correct? Yeah, um, I, about 20, 25% showed up. But that's when I checked it the first go around in two, uh, 2010. But I later checked in 2013 and 2015, and more and more names showed up. So the number is much higher now because um, some of those kids who have been taking Social Security uh, benefits from their um, allegedly deceased father have turned 18 and they can't take the benefits anymore. And for that reason, the number can be retired and placed on the SSDI. You know, it'll, it'll grow even more. Um, Todd Beamer, one person I point out, um, one of his daughters uh, will turn 18 in the year 2020. So I suspect that his name will show up next year. Yeah, absolutely incredible. And another aspect of it was about the cell phone calls and um, is there able, are, are people able to reach each other in 19, 2001 using cell phone at such a high altitude? No, our only cell phone, uh, no, they, they was, uh, and the, there's a gentleman, A.K. Dudney, who was uh, proved this among other people, that if you go to high enough, like when the plane's at uh, cruising altitude, there's just no way in the world a, a cell phone call would have worked then. Uh, feedback phones, however, uh, did work, and that became another argument that spawned for a number of years, it seems like, as the you know, question of whether certain planes had uh, seat phones or not. But in the case of Flight 77, it never took off, so <laughs> it's kind of point is kind of moot. Oh, um, there's one thing i got to point out. I have read, um, it was on Let's Roll forums, a uh, person who goes by the pseudonym Loop de Loop did a really good... It was a very long um, blog, I'd say, with lots of other people participating, in which he talked about uh, Pico cells uh, being used and how um, the use of a Pico cell could be used at, at the high, high 
high altitude to call people from the air. And that was of interest um, as I read that. Uh, again, it's on Let's Roll Forums. The, uh, a lot of good information. I was able to check out um, some FBI uh, reports or uh, interviews that were made. But as far as the Pico cell goes, um, the authors seem to believe that uh, the Pico cell phone was used on planes, and they seem to believe there's a plane involving Betty Ong, and I'm not sure quite what to say about that. Um, I, they don't seem to connect, though, with the fact that Flight 11 didn't fly, and it kind of makes it hard to understand the last part of what they're saying in the most recent messages. But back to your point, um, apparently uh, this phone, and it got its origins uh, from an Israeli company um, in a clear box, and I'm not a wizard with how all that works precisely, but my understanding was that there were certain phones under certain circumstances that could have worked back then. Were you talking about Amdoc? Is that what you were referring to? I believe so. I believe that was it, yes. Absolutely. So there is definitely an Israeli connection with 9-11. I mean, because America is intrinsically connected to Israel. It's almost the 51st state of the United States. And it's kind of hard to separate the two. Like, where does the one begin and where it ends? You know, especially <laughs> since they're t- tied up in the um, field of technology and innovations. I mean, they're calling the Israel the startup company. Wh- whether you think a lot of that technology was stolen or not, that's another discussion for another day. <laughs> well, right. Uh, I would just say briefly that the word was put out some years after 9 11 that the technology I was just talking about came out in 2004. But, you know, when you got, um, oh, let's say the Mossad and other intelligence agencies possibly involved in this, I mean, why wouldn't they mislead people about when they got started? I think that's part of intelligence is to mislead, just part of what they do. So, yeah, intelligence, Mossad's um, use of technology and the misleading of people as to when the technology started was all a part of uh, this hoax that we call 9-11. Isn't it amazing that the word intelligence is really a euphemism for disinfo itself? <laughs> that goes to show you yeah. how Orwellian this whole subject is. And their their definitely job is, you know, the CIA, Mossad, and whatever foreign intelligence service you want to assign to this. Their job yeah. is not to keep secrets, really, you know, like the central intelligence. It's actually to confuse the F out of you. <laughs> to yeah. the point... And the the propaganda is catapulted. You remember George Bush talked about this is the way you catapult the propaganda. It's oh, prop- yeah. catapulted <laughs> to the citizens first. To, if if you could get the whole collective in America confused about it, th- there's not going to be any links to other nations because they got <laughs> nobody to give information to because everybody's essentially retarded, even in the professional sector, to a certain degree. I mean, they're smart enough to do their job, but critical thinking skills, come on, there's nothing up here. Tuck, tuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, the power of information gives people the power to misinform. And I, I see this go on, and uh, probably it, it's all around the, the country, all around the world, that if you are in the know, you're not going to talk. And if you talk, you're probably not in the know. <laughs> loose lip sink ships my friend do not snitch <laughs> you know <laughs> and, and, and at the same time we have a snitch culture too so it's incredible how all this coincides with each other but new new york new york i mean like that's the epicenter of crime i i, I hate to as an american and i'm patriotic but i, I gotta say like it is i mean it's the it's a rat's nest to a certain degree with crime and corruption in that city. I mean, Donald Trump is a byproduct of it. And he has some very sticky, sticky hands, if you know what I mean, to get where he is. A lot of dirty handshakes. And you got the Port Authority, and the mob runs the port, doesn't it, Dean? Oh, man. The Ow. criminal underworld, you know, the mob. How do the rest of us have a chance if we, you know, play it honestly and do the right thing? It's we're up against a big, big wall of misinformation and people who just, you know, it's no holds barred. Everything is on the table uh, for unethical people. It just puts everybody else at quite a disadvantage. That's that's what we've been going up against the last seventeen, eighteen years. 
and people have no reference level. They have no real world. Uh, they have no real world experience to be able to contest inside their mind. You know what a plane would look like if it impacted a tower whatsoever. But people tend to accept the fact that it did happen, and this was the first time, second and third time that a tower has ever collapsed on its own weight by fire itself and no lights go off on their head. And there's just so many people that, you know, live and work in architectures, you know, they got the nine 11 um, truth architectures. I know I just slaughtered that, but I mean, I don't know how real world people could be so into themselves that they don't really see the light. Well, it's probably the same people, the same kinds of people who really believe the magic bullet theory, going back to JFK. A bullet that zigzags in midair, changes directions. <laughs> people uh, another, another thing that strikes me is at the Pentagon on Flight 77, that they actually believe in Arlington that there is DNA test samples and everybody aboard that plane has a dna sample and there's that that's that ace in the hole for a lot of 9-11 truthers to say that's proof that a plane impacted uh the pentagon because of that dna samples as if that's a gotcha <laughs> you know the authorities wow. went in there and they collected every single sample and everybody's accounted for except for an unborn infant and a pregnant woman and that's it Oh, it's all from the authorities, though. <laughs> Show me something that uh, the source is independent. And and how do they do these DNA tests, anyways? <laughs> what exactly do they find? How sure are these DNA tests? You know, I'm I'm done standing on the street calling for an independent investigation because there's no point. Then we're not going to get an honest and independent investigation we got to do the investigating ourselves, if you know what i mean oh yeah um steve dayock has a 9-11 crash test where his thing is he believes that the first thing you should do when investigating a crime is to rebuild the crime site itself and he wants to use this rocket sled test to see if an aluminum um you know fin or plane you know wing could actually go cut through like hot butter um, through a steel facade itself. Um, <laughs> I remember I, I kept getting the emails about this. Uh, I think it was a couple of years ago. I think you're on that thread as well, right? Yeah, we got a email from a person named Heidi that I've never met in my entire life, but she likes to email me, and I, I read about three of them, and the rest went into the gutter. Oh, man. I so remember. Some, some online troll. And and that's persistent in my line of work. I got my fair share of cyber, cyber stalkers and trolls and internet de- uh, denizens like emailing me all the time about stupid stuff. I got to tell you this, Dean. You're a lawyer, right? Yeah. I got an email um, claiming that they're from a PR firm um, from the... Uh, London Stock Exchange and okay. a particular Bitcoin site, and I, I told them to get the f out of town, shut the front door, right? Yeah. And it, and it turns out it, they sent me a certified letter, and it was genuine to, for me to take down a certain blog that I had. And and I was like, oh my god, you know, they're gonna like threaten me with action if I don't take down this particular blog. And then I researched the blog that I posted. And it turns out that there was a weak source on it that was incorrect. And oh, I'll just take it down, you know. So, so that's another aspect of it is trolls and like I mean, fed like false, you know, narratives because our intuition is crunched on the fact of what we see and all the time. And if we're getting spoon fed BS all the time, you know, that's generally what comes out. And if you're just dealing with, dealing with trolls all the time, you don't really believe that, you know, that this like billion dollar, for, you know, company trillion dollar because the Rothschilds are worth $500 trillion would actually take time to email uh, or mail me 
uh, rollyquay.com, you know, on a little rinky dink right. blog site. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's not rinky dinky, it's vastly popular, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> I've been there, <laughs> but also, yeah. like, yeah, go ahead, Dean, tell me what you're gonna say. Oh, well, yeah, there are trolls out there, I, I get them quite a bit. People always wanting to pick a fight or start an argument over something. Uh, I'm talking about how I'm insulting the uh, passengers on 9-11. And I'm telling them, you got to prove to my satisfaction there were passengers on 9-11. Especially when you talk about flights 11 and 77. I can't say for sure what really happened with the other two flights uh, um, in terms of passengers, 175 and 93. I do believe and there's I do document it as to how they flew in the direction of the Midwest. Uh, but as far as people boarding those planes, I don't know. I, I haven't seen the evidence of it, but uh, yeah, I'm just, I get these you know, people accusing me of stuff and making up things and saying, I said this and that, and that's just how it goes. It's just always people out there, people that are apparently are very alert to uh, blogs or statements about nine 11 on the internet. And um, that's what we're going up against. Yeah, absolutely. And people like the straw man, you like not even read any of your books, just assume that you said something that you didn't. I thought that's something only my wife does. To me. <laughs> 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 but oh. it's, it's so amazing. They don't study the precursory details like, there were certain things not found at ground zero during 9-11. One, for example, was a four multi-ton Boeing uh, 767 turned by an engine. And I got a picture of what those look like with a person stand behind me. And it is massive. And another thing not found during ground zero was four indestructible flight records. That wasn't found whatsoever. And most troopers believe this, but they don't conclude that that's because there were no planes. And yeah, that would be like a logical conclusion. Right. And, and we heard about with Flight 77 in the Pentagon that Donald Rumsfeld was on the lawn and he picked up parts from the plane and put them in a utility shed of the Pentagon. Just like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, there are reports of people that, well, I got, I kind of get into a tangle with, um, Robin Swan, who, with her husband, uh, Anthony Summers, uh, wrote a book about 9-11 that I criticized on Amazon. And she was saying that people like me would understand better about the passengers of Flight 77 if I had seen the, uh, the evidence that she has seen. I'm just wondering, you know, where'd you get this evidence? Um, are you and only you allowed to see it? Uh, <laughs> I, I just wondered um, what the story was. I really expected better from Anthony Summers on the book. I think it was called The Eleventh Day. I just, I really didn't like it at all. It just seemed like a an endorsement of the official theory for the most part. And uh, they just kind of lost me when they talked like that about Flight 77, about uh, AK Dudney and others. Um, just showing me they didn't really read what I had said, which I think ties back to something you were saying earlier. People just don't always read before they uh, criticize. I see this happen with other people's books as well. It's just really a lack of critical thinking, and it's just a, a big roadblock that's totally unnecessary. I've been making it a point to read a book every day for the past two, two months. I got audible.com and... I, I listen to my Bluetooth while I'm at work, and I try to take lots and lots of notes. And I think that's the best way about it to get self-educated. And I know that it is tough, you know, with the grind, the drudgery of the capitalist system. But uh, we're moving on to the second half, and I'm getting bad, bad feedback on my end. Okay. Do you have anything to say before we move on um, to, to, to break, uh, Dean? Uh, I can't help but say my website, uh, www.deanhartwell.com. 
Absolutely. Thank you for plugging that site. And I will be <laughs> sure to read the phone number in the second hour in case we get any callers. And we'll be right back, folks, um, for hour number two with Dean Hartwell. No planes, no passengers. You decide. How to invent a religion. I always knew we had to be willing to die to even do this job. Yeah, he's a psychopathic killer, but so what? Playing around. What is What's the first and principal thing he does? What means does he serve by killing? Things like orders. and the maintenance of a secret government within our government.
All right, we're back. You seem to found my top secret party, Black Ball or Rolly Quaid, right here on revisionmedia.org. And of course, we got our very special guest with us, Dean Hartwell. And I want to make sure that I gave out that number the best I can. A lot of my listeners of the collective hive mind know that I'm very dyslexic and always screw this part up. So refrain from doing that. <laughs> I'm going to do this slowly. Eight five five four nine two six zero four nine. Have your voice heard and come and talk to Dean Hartwell. Dean, um, had a good break. Got another cup of coffee. Um, how are you doing again? I'm oh, doing great. Thanks. Uh, do you hear me clearly? I hear you wonderfully. Oh, good. It, it's amazing, Julian Assange. You know this big whistle blower that was holed up for quite some time in an embassy over in London, you know, the Ecuadorian embassy, they say that he's like the voice of truth, you know, or, or, or he's a traitor, you know, which is pretty interesting to call Julian Assange a traitor, especially since he's never, he's not a United States citizen for one and actually never been in the United States before being (laughs) extradited. So every time I hear that, I really feel like pulling the threads out of my hair, you know, itself. It's like I'm taking crazy pills like Zoolander, you know? (laughs) Yeah. uh, One thing about Julian Assange, you know, the source of truth is he's perpetually annoyed by 9-11. And he always would smugly say, you know, our site WikiLeaks exposes real conspiracies. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Captain Douche over here, you know. I, I really don't like the guy. I think that WikiLeaks is a disinformation campaign and is saturated with just as much BS as your day to day corporate media and is really a propaganda tool of the establishment itself. Probably an 80 20. Uh, Maybe correct eighty percent of the time, uh, just enough to get people to follow it, and then they, after they're hooked in, um, they put out the twenty percent that's not true. Yeah, it's that fair uh, news something act where the media has to present half truths. You know, as long as it's like there's some truth in there that could lie to you legally. You know, it's legal for the corporate media to make bunk stories as long as there's some sort of truth embedded in there. It, it's absolutely amazing, you know, this disinformation campaign. Well, yeah, I think also the half truth is more dangerous than the lie because the lie, the absolute one hundred percent lie, you can see through pretty easily. Uh, something that's half truth, uh, true, uh, I think, is a different story. It's often difficult to figure out. There's actually a theory that I did not construct myself, but it's coming from the same man that introduced me to this known plane theory. So it's called pan fakery. And what it essentially is, is, and I'm going to buttress this ideology tonight, <laughs> is mm-hmm. the idea that everything is fake, you know, that is reported on the mainstream media. And I always work back on that conclusion when dealing with stories, just assuming that. And I find it's actually easier if you just don't think the narrative as being anything true, but instead think of it as something contrived and manipulated in order to manipulate you into believing something that is against your own will and your best interests. And that's sort of what I I, I think, you know, and I'm pushing that meme, pan, pan fakery itself. Well, that's a good framework. It's a better framework than just assuming what you see on TV to be true. I mean, gee, I, I think a lot of it, uh, we just see part part of the truth on TV or other forms of the media. We don't see the rest of it. I think a lot of things just get covered up. Like, uh, you know, back to the BTS records, there's no way that ABC News is ever going to go into that at all about how two of the flights didn't really fly. They've, they've already committed. They've already gone public along with all the other news agencies that such and such happened on 9-11, and they're not going to double back. So they're forced to tell half-truths at this point. Yeah, isn't it amazing that the mainstream media is all three-letter agencies, except for, of course, MSNBC, and that's because <laughs> of Microsoft. You know, that's where they got the word. You know, it used yeah. to be the national broadcasting company. But three 
age, the three letter agency corporation are telling the news with <laughs> definitely, if you understand Pro- Operation Mockingbird, about the relationship between the Secret Services and their whores, which is reporters itself. Yeah. And they actually refer to that as often, you know, enough, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> But it, it's absolutely amazing, you know, a reporter will do anything to get a fresh lead on a story. And that means going into the water hole where these guys hang out and get a fresh tip about what's going on, usually while being wine and dine with the guy. You know, it, it's not really we, we've left that uh, Gary Webb investigative uh, yeah. reporter stage, you know, and it's pathetic that it's only you and I and the other handful of people that are actually doing that. And the, the support I get for it financially is next to none, you know, and I do get a lot of fan support, but I mean, there's not anybody in the business that's making money while telling the truth. And that's just a sad state of an affairs. Yeah. Um, the truth doesn't really sell too well. <laughs> I think people just don't really want to know the truth. And that was something I I point out in uh, Mythology 9-11, the most recent book, where people know something to be false, and um, they just they stick with it. It's it's just too much to confront it. It's too too much to uh, go back on what they say they believe. It's just not comfortable. And I I point out uh, in the introduction part of the book that something happened in my childhood. I witnessed a, a baseball game that I knew was just faked. I mean, talk about fakery, that one team was deliberately throwing the game, and anybody not connected to either team would see that. But the uh, mother of one of the uh, players on the team that benefited from the thrown game got upset when I, when I suggested it. It was like, oh, don't, don't bother me with that. That's very uncomfortable. That's offensive. Don't talk that way. And it, the whole idea of what was true, what was false, just goes by the wayside. And I think you go on to more serious things, like whether terrorists acted to do something like 9-11 or not, it's even more uncomfortable for people to, to distinguish themselves and say, hey, I doubt this, I don't believe it. I mean, I feel like I've been in that uh, world for uh, some time now where I'm kind of the oddball. <laughs> I, I, I went to a Toastmaster meeting, a, now, well, less than a year ago, and by that time, I'd already tired of talking about 9-11 because people made it clear they didn't really care to hear it, but I was asked a question about 9-11, and I gave my answer, the answer, same answer I gave given before, and I get verbally pilloried by some of the people there for saying that, uh, you know, I don't believe the official theory. It's not comfortable. I mean, you go anywhere, the workplace. You go to um, clubs like Toastmasters, uh, a lot of friends, acquaintances. Um, you know, they just kind of look at you funny. <laughs> that is actually fascinating where you got your start. My start was I did a radio show on a radio network called Renegated, and I was making my predictions about Conor McGregor, the UFC fighter, in a boxing match with Floyd Mayweather Jr. And I voiced my opinion about that fight actually being rigged. And I don't know if you know this about me, uh, Dean. Did you you know that I worked as a professional MMA fighter till just retiring a couple years ago? You you know, I was uh, looking you up on the internet and I did uh, run across the information. It's very interesting. Yeah, that's actually the first thing that pops up with looking really quaid. And that's something that I tried to keep on the... DL a little bit on radio, yeah. you know, because I'm already a public <laughs> figure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't like to mix the two, you know, especially since like I, I like to fight and I want to do it again, you know, as soon as, as soon as my kids get a little bit bigger where they can handle day being gone for three months, but that's mm, not the case wow. right now. But yeah, I'm not, I don't want them to me to come home and I'm all bruised up in the eyes and I just don't want to go through that again right now, but I'm healthy and fit enough to do that. But it's interesting, you know, where I got my start was on my predictions about Mayweather uh, versus Conor McGregor. And I knew a lot of the players and 
yeah, my gut feeling was it's going to be a rigged fight. And there's this person, um, Bob Urham, who's partners with Shadel uh, Adelson, Shadel Adelson. Okay. And uh, they own the Venetian together, and they run the whole uh, Las Vegas Strip itself. And he's kind of the prime minister or the pope of boxing, and he determines who wins and loses. Just like the scenario with Pulp Fiction, where you got um, Marcus Wallace, who tells, you know, Butch, you, you go down in the whatever round it was, you know, and... When I was training in Las Vegas, somebody actually told me that's like a lot of how it is in the, the big leagues is they rig every fight, you know, in boxing. And it's it's something I knew but really didn't know. And I talked about a fight that I actually got into that I actually kind of kind of <laughs> took a dive. But uh, it was something that wasn't my choice, you know. Um, yeah. And unfortunately – you know, they say about the media, the only thing you could depend on is uh, game scores and the weather, and you cannot depend on game scores is what I'm trying to tell you. And they've never been really good about the weather, to tell you the truth. It seems that we got an unknown caller, unknown soldier. How are you doing? You're on Black Ball with Rolly Quaid. Uh, thank you for having me. It's Adam Fitzgerald. Adam, you're back. What's going on? Yes, indeed. Yeah, like, uh, well, there was a point uh, Dean made earlier before the break, um, and I think, oh, I want to get him right, uh, I'll quote it the best I can, and it says, can anyone say they drove any passenger to the airport? Uh, that was a point you made, Mr. Harwell? Hi, Adam. Uh, yes, I did ask that question. Uh, can anybody, or has anybody said that they have driven anybody to the airport on that particular day for one of those flights? Sure. Uh, I'd like to reiterate that point, if I may. Uh, one of the uh, passengers was actually Marie Ray Sopper. Um, are you familiar with that name? Anybody? Rolly? Dean? No. All right. Marie Ray Sopper was on uh, Flight 77. Uh, she was actually driven to the airport by a close friend of hers when she was at the Navy Judge Advocate General's Office Corps, or JAG. And his name was Jim Bailey, and he actually drove her to Dallas International Airport. Now, the reason why I'm um, bringing up Marie Ray Sopper is because he's very important. Uh, not too long ago, Motley Rice, as a lawyer's firm, actually produced uh, for the first time uh, the security video taken at Dulles of uh, showing two hijackers, Khalid Al-Midar and Majid Makid. And this is a point of controversy because a lot of people say, well, there's no um, timestamp on the video itself. It's actually erased because the FBI wanted to look at the whole video. But the the, rec the recording video, uh, the duplicate itself, was obtained by Molly Rice. And Maria Ray Sopper is actually in the video. And you could see her right before. Um, she's actually coming through security first. And she's actually holding a animal cargo holder. It's red. And right behind her is Khalid Al-Midar and Maja Bak. And the video is authentic. and. Uh, she was actually driven at the airport, and she died on Flight 77. Well, oh, Adam, yeah. how do you know that's authentic? How is it authentic? Well, I'm friends with her mother on Facebook, Marion Kimenek. I'm actually, I actually called Motley Rice, lawyer's term. Well, the video's authentic enough. Yeah, Adam, um, why don't you send me the information you got, because I have no idea who Rice is, no offense. And no, no problem. It's something it's something I'm going to need to investigate and maybe um, if I find out that this information you have is authentic and worth talking about, I'll invite you on to my show. But for right now, I just want to give Dean his time because I might not yeah, get no him for problem. a I couple just more to bring up that. I, yeah, no problem. I just wanted yeah. to bring up that point. Uh, good show, by the way. So I'll keep listening. Okay. Thank you very much for that input, Adam. Yeah. So Dean, Let's mm -hmm. switch gear, gears a little bit. You know, in this world that we live in, you know, like our brains and, you know, we're developed and the hunter and gatherer sense of the word. And now we're being really like hyper um, simulated and stimulated, if you would. 
can our brains really handle like this fast moving information that's being circulated in the media itself? Like a lot of psychologists, you know, actually wonder about that. And another thing I wanted to ask you about um, video edit editing is really in the peak of propaganda right now on in this current juncture where we are as a human race, is it possible that the planes that we saw during 9-11 were somehow digitally altered in some way or doctored? Sure, it's possible. Um, looking at it, um, I mean, it does appear that a plane's flying into the respective uh, buildings at the World Trade Center, but you don't know what the screen really represents. And the example I remember uh, getting from Jim Fetzer, who we talked a little bit uh, a while back, I mean, think about what you see on the, a, a football game. You see a, a yellow line representing the first down. And because those of us familiar with football know there's no yellow line like that on the actual field, we know that the yellow line is something superimposed. It's just an example of what people who work television graphics can do. It's, it wouldn't be very hard to construct something on the screen to make it appear to be a plane. So it's, uh, what, to answer your question, yes, it's certainly possible. Yeah, even uh, Kyle Simmons, who was aboard Chopper 5 um, on the Hackensack River, you know, he was an expert at video compositing itself. And in this realm of ideas that we're discussing tonight in TV fakery, I mean, it's urgent, in my opinion, to clear the cobwebs and realize that TV fakery is a big, intricate part of our lives. You know, right now they're talking about uh, Madonna doing her new music video, and I don't know why she's still making music, to be honest. <laughs> you know, it's it, she did a song that's half in Spanish where she's singing in English with a Hispanic man that is like, um, 40 years <laughs> younger, her senior, you know, she's very old, you know, um, and it's called the Medina and she's going to take like this music video she did and she's going to have all, uh, hologram pepper ghost digitally enhanced like dancers, you know, for the live performance of this particular show that's going to happen soon. And, it's very interesting. They've gone a lot from Tupac, you know, to now. Oh, yeah. It's it's getting very real, if you know what I mean. Oh, yeah. Um, and a lot of the Marvel movies, you know, um, for an example, Endgame just came out with the Avengers. And once you've seen one of them, you've pretty much seen them all, you know. <laughs> but I, I watch them from a clinical standpoint to wonder, like, you know, where are we at, you know, with CGI. And I write a lot of articles that don't necessarily have anything to do with 9-11 about conspiracies with CGI itself. And, yeah, I watch a lot of Marvel, and that's a, where a lot of people's minds are is in Marvel comic books. And I, I thought that, you know, um, once you're a man, you get out of superheroes and stuff and fake <laughs> identities and, and move on to other things. <laughs> Like women, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it's not a turn on for women to know that you're into boyish things, if you know what I mean. Mm. But uh, yeah, it's 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 amazing how people are sucked into the CGI, you know, revolution itself, and it's it's amazing. Like your book title, you know, was nine eleven a movie. You know, in the 90s, right before 9-11, people really liked disaster movies. You know, that was very popular, like uh, Tornado or Twister. Oh, or, yeah. Twister. Yeah. There's also uh, Independence Day with Will Smith where he punches an Day. alien. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was good, yeah. That, that was another kind of disaster movie. And it was kind of an age where, like, the Soviet U Empire or Soviet Union d just fell on its head. You know, it's gone. Yeah. And America is in need of an enemy. <laughs> Something like Colin <laughs> Powell said that um, his greatest fear about the Soviet Union was it would collapse. That way they would never have a perpetual enemy. He said in like a Fortune magazine. I, I totally paraphrase that. But um, it's something that the neocons were worrying about, and there were neocons inside the Independence Day movie. They're like, blast the alien. 
<laughs> right now, <laughs> we don't need peaceful negotiations. Finally, we had a war. <laughs> we, we weren't doing nothing for five years, you know. That's something that uh, they, they promoted a lot, you know, these sort of hawkish opinions and even in these disaster movies itself. And there's a pipeline between Hollywood and the Pentagon and the CIA in, in order for a, a for ordered for a director to go and get like jets, you know, for movie or tanks or guns or personnel to be in their movie. They got to go and kiss some Pentagon ass and lick some boots. If you know what I mean, to get that, mm. you know, that, 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 that chopper that they want. So, so that's the kind of age that we were in right before nine 11 was that that was, was popular and then it became kind of, you know, in the 2000s, it became um, Hurt Locker, kind of like, I'm an unappreciated soldier kind of vibe, but uh, yeah. you know, it's virtuous to be in the military. And don't get me wrong, it's, it's, it's a great job, and I respect the military and the service. And I actually tend to listen to military personnel more than I do common citizens when it comes to sources. Still take that little grain of salt, knowing that they were part of that beehive, you know, mentality. You know, I'm a soldier, you know, kind of like the mentality that we saw on uh, that particular movie directed by Oliver Stone, um, Platoon. And then, of course, yeah. And of course, uh, you know, Stanley Kubrick, you know, made a full metal jacket. And the reason he made that movie, he was obsessed with mind control. Because he did Cl- Cl- Clockwork Orange, you know, that was a big mind control movie. Right. And then, uh, of course, he wanted to do that to explore what it would take for a soldier to want to march up a hill and die for his country with no thought or forethought about what it would take, you know. So so that, that, was, and that was popular in the 80s, you know, like Vietnam movies, you know, they were not popular in the 70s. <laughs> it was heresy <laughs> <laughs> to like a <laughs> Vietnam movie back then. But it's absolutely amazing, like, how the infusion with our culture and movies are itself. And, yeah, I feel like the country that I live in, the lunatics have taken over the asylum sometimes. It feels like I'm in crazy nutville. Everybody yeah. seems to be a basket case from one degree or another. Yeah, I know. It just feels kind of hopeless sometimes, like we're stuck in this big ditch. But we took a wrong train years ago. We we never gotten back on track. Just sad, you know. Going it, off it, going the rails back to, on a crazy train, <laughs> like crazy Ozzie. train. <laughs> Ozzy, yes. <yeah. laughs> <laughs> oh, just funny how Ozzy became popular again uh, with the Bush administration. He, he, I remember he went to the uh, well, the second Bush. That is, I remember he went to the White House. Just kind of thing. The world was kind of turned up upside down. <laughs> you know, you did just touched on something very interesting that I want to tell you about, Dean. Do you yeah. remember um, Cheryl, who's Ozzy's wife, was on the View, right? Yeah, Cheryl. And, uh, and I don't remember if she was on this particular show, and I'm going to say she was. But they had Jesse Ventura on the show. You know, in this little yeah. Uh, you know, a uh, circle of friends that are not really friends. <laughs> They're a bunch right, of letter right. grabbers that want to eat each other apart, right? But um, he talked about 9-11, and he tried to tell these women, you know, like, rationalize, you know, I was a Navy SEAL, you know, controlled demolition, you know, occurred a lot in my job as a Navy SEAL. <laughs> so I've seen controlled demolition before. <laughs> Oh, and, you know, and it really was that flow, you know, like he tried to tell them that Tower 7, you know, was not impacted by a plane. So if you believe that, and he didn't say this, but if you believe that Tower 7 was not impacted by a plane, you're pretty much a no planer just off the get go. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> You know, also but, the official report never even mentioned uh, Building 7. Yeah, how did they leave that one out? That that kind of leads me to believe that a lot was missing in that report. And it took them a long time to get off their hands and get off their ass and actually do something and write a report itself, you know, because they didn't even want to write the damn thing to begin with. 
No, they sure didn't. And then um, somebody asked Donald Rumsfeld what he thought about building a 70, and he said, what? What's that? He might have not, honest to God, you know, knew about Tower 7, the Solomon building. He he seems like he's one of the type of guys that have been um, kept in on a need-to-know basis because he's that that dumb Dave. That, that's something I, like, see with Dick Cheney and, and George W., I think the senior knew a lot more than the rest of those guys, but he, of course, you know, he wasn't even a factor, you know, in the administration besides of leaving his legacy to his son. You know, that was pretty, pretty much it. You know, um, he, he probably did pull a couple strings and definitely was involved, but as far as being the, these, these, you know, nincompoop idiots, you know, that you can almost have plausible deniability like Reagan with these guys. Cause you're like, how intelligent are these guys that are running our nation right now? <laughs> and the, the neocons and the people from PNAC are just absolutely just running the Pentagon. And Valerie yeah. Plain even talked about there's these dual citizens from Israel that just come yeah. in and they don't even need a badge to check in. They just walk right on in and they, they don't have any war experience. None of those guys serve. You know, John Bolton was a draft dodger, you know, for example. Well, actually, to tell you the truth, right now with this current administration, you know, um, John Bolton, of course, he brewed back in, you know, the neocons have taken over again. Amazing yeah. how that happens. You can't keep him out. He's, <laughs> Donald Trump is swapping the drain, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, did you ever hear that quote from... Uh, Donald Trump, and he's had a lot of military quotes before, where his personal Vietnam was hookers and cocaine. That's an authentic quote. Oh, I've quote. never heard that quote. Wow. That was his personal Vietnam. Oh. He, he's like polar opposite of the image that I have in, a, in my head of a still-jawed American patriot, you know? You know, yeah. cr- Christian to the core, you know, Donald Trump. You know, he doesn't even feel the need to apologize. <laughs> he lacks agency. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> he said the uh, two Thessalonians we were asked about the Bible. Yeah, actually, you did write a book on uh theology book, didn't you? What was the title of that book? Oh, yes, it was called St. Peter's Choice. Can, can you uh, plug that book for me real quick? I'm not familiar with that. Sure. It it's, um, uses the person of St. Peter, and who uh, it's, he observes what's going on on Judgment Day, and he talks to a number of people who go to heaven. He gets their personal stories. Um, one of them uh, is a very wealthy man. He says the Bible taught him to you know make money and all that, and St. Peter just kind of wondered what Bible did this guy read, and other people like that. But the bottom line is that just ask a person, Anybody, um, would you give up your soul? Would you give up your right to fit for yourself to go to heaven? And St. Peter ultimately decides that, uh, no, that's, that's not worth it. And he doesn't go to heaven. And that's, that's the bottom line. Are you familiar with uh, Norman Vincent Peel? He's, yeah. Yeah, he's actually Donald Trump's spiritual leader before he died and still today like impact him and it's the power of uh positive thinking that trump uses it's not just roy Cohn that influenced him it's this particular gentleman and he's always wearing a shriner hat every picture i see him in which is of course part of freemasonry oh Oh, did you did you know that bill was a freemason no no i didn't know that I uh, wonder yeah. what the Freemasons are, though. <laughs> oh, oh, I would recommend listening to 40 hours of um, Bill Cooper's Mystery Babylon series. That's probably the best introduction to Freemasonry itself. Okay. But, yeah, I, I've grown a lot, like, uh, with the, you know, knowing about the Freemasons for many, many years. And I, I do think that the old boy um, establishment definitely impacts, you know, our country, you know, the pay for play, I stretch my back, I scratch yours. And Freemasonry is one of those aspects 
but it's not necessarily like, um, well, I'll, it's heresy to say not the most important thing, <laughs> mm. <laughs> but it, it's something to look at if you know what I'm, I mean. Hmm. And, and it's yeah, a, I mean, I've just always wondered who they are. I mean, I've got people in my family who are members of this group, and I still don't really have a, a grasp at all of what they do or what their meetings are about. Yeah, my my dad used to take off Thursday nights, and we never knew where he went. <laughs> he just like leave us at home. You know, well, that's when they do the, the do their meetings and they do their little rituals that go back to antiquity and. Um, it's basically like a rite of passage, like you would see with African tribes Yeah, and they do various rituals and it's not really a secret except for the rituals that they do. And it's supposed to like enhance the being or make you more enlightened. But Bill Cooper actually argues that it's a form of conditioning. Like for example, when you get sworn in to be a Freemason, you come in with a noose around your neck, blindfolded and one leg up and you take a blood oath to never reveal the secrets and you kneel, conceal and never reveal. And that's one of the slogan earrings about being a Freemason. And the idea is that you lie about what goes on, even to your own family at the edge of a sword about what, what Freemasons do and their publications are very revealing, like Albert Pike. And there's this idea that nobody really speaks for Freemasonry itself, you know, that it's kind of a collective hive mindset. But if you want to bear your nose, I, and I would recommend Albert Pike. He's a, he's a fast-paced, like, interesting writer to read, to be honest. I'm interested in a lot of his works that he does. You know, they're very repeat, revealing. Another one is uh, Mackie, um, and uh, there's Albert, Albert Mackie. I haven't studied this in a long, long time, uh, who write a, like an encyclopedia of uh, Freemasonry. And then there's uh, Manly uh, P. Hall, which is another writer to look at. And he's wrote like several books, like up to 50. And all of them are really, really interesting. They got... Uh, America's assignment with destiny and he oh. links like American to uh, the Americans to the old world as if there were a bunch of explorers that came over and influenced the Aztecs and stuff like that. Um, Discordianism. I think that's the word for it. Huh. But uh, yeah, if you ever have time, I would recommend you studying Bill Cooper first and a lot of Freemasons will actually tell you to read Behold, Behold a Pell Horse um, as one of the books that they would recommend you to read to understand Freemasonry. Another thing they would tell you to read is um, Alexander Huxley's uh, book, and I can't remember. I am drawing Brave a blank. Brave, Brave New, New World. World. Bingo. That's the yeah. second book they would tell you to read to get an introduction to Freemasonry. Is that really about conditioning people, you think? A abs absolutely. Freemasonry is definitely about um, conditioning. Um, they believe if you look at like the Pyramid of Giza and you see and observe the Sphinx, right? You okay. notice that the Sphinx is half human and half man. And they believe that human beings are nothing more than man, you know, um, with a brain and their whole course is enlightenment and they want to enlighten themselves and they have a different version of the Bible that you've never read before. And if you take a King James Bible, they'll read it without Christian blinders and read it a di totally different way. They oh, believe wow. that Adam and Eve was imprisoned by a cruel and unjust, vindictive, evil God that was so wrathful. And he held him prisoner in the bonds of ignorance and the Garden of Eden. But then wow. Lucifer came and enlightened Adam and Eve in freedom from bondage. And so Lucifer was the good guy in the story. Huh. Okay. So, and they believe that uh, 
Christianity is a bastardized version of the mysteries. And you know about Greek mysteries and Roman mysteries and Babylonian mysteries. Um, Freemasons came about in the 18th century, about 1717. And they, they try to build all the mysteries together. And they were formed based on other secret societies that previously existed, like the Rosicrucians. Oh, yeah. And the the Americans, you know, like system itself, like most of the founding fathers were either Masons or belonged to other secret societies. And they even wrote in the Constitution about secret societies itself as being part of um, our nation's experience. Hmm, okay. I hope I didn't lay that on too heavy for you. No, I'm like, uh, I usually... I, I I usually get like two minutes of starry eyes before I I'm like oh good stop you know like in the real world you know I never get to talk about this out loud. <laughs> oh no, I, I I just always think about secret societies. How do we ever learn their secrets, and how can we be sure that what we heard uh, about the secrets is really valid? I, it's just kind of a bizarre thing to me, but very interesting. Actually, Freemasonry was a template for uh, like for government agencies. Like, for example, Hoover would not let anybody in the FBI who was not a Mason. Oh wow! For example, huh. so so there's it was a spy network, you know, in the 19th century, and I would say even before the OSS, to be honest, you know, it was kind of a there's a kind of that spy apparatus. MI6 and MI5 is very influential, and they use a lot of the, the Masonic imagery on their symbols. Symbols. They see, you know, like numbers. I, I find symbols to be very interesting. Symbols and number. Matter of fact, there's uh, S.K. Bale. Are you familiar with that 9-11 author that wrote about uh, 9-11 itself? Being a uh, Masonic ritual? Yes. I, I may well have read that book at one time, but first you know your name. Yeah, it's actually pretty interesting because in Freemasonry, there's two sacred um, pillars. And it comes directly from the Bible. And then there's the Solomon's Temple that's connected to the two pillars. And, of course, during 9-11, you had the Solomon, you know, uh, building. <laughs> and then you got the two pillars. And... Actually, uh, the idea of the two towers came from Freemasonry, from the brainchild of Nelson and David Rockefeller itself. Oh, so yeah. they wanted the two pillars of Freemasonry st stood at one time before they were knocked down and replaced by the One World uh, Tower, you know, which stands now. Okay. Yeah, the Rockefellers so, are kind of all over this. Uh, they did have a big influence on the World Trade Center getting built. Oh, that was their baby. That was a little pet project. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Dean, we got 20 minutes left, and I just wanted to leave these last 20 minutes to you. Is there any other topic you would like to talk about tonight? Um, how about the Robert Kennedy assassination? Go ahead. Let's go. Okay. Let's switch gears. Switch gears. I, I mean, it's just always so obvious to me that it just what happened or what the official story in this wasn't on the up and up. Um, coincidentally, this happened the year I was born, so I didn't uh, actually see this or experience it. Um, but at first learning about this assassination, I remember seeing a, um, a show which. It, it sounded like countless bullets were being fired, and then um, I later uh, read up on it, and the official theory was that Sirhan Sirhan had, had fired eight bullets, and they found all the bullets. Um, then um, that sounds all fine and dandy, like it's an open and shut case, but um, when the, when I read deeper into it, it, it became clear that Sirhan was never in a position to shoot uh, Kennedy. He was always in front of him, according to all the eyewitnesses. Uh, he was never uh, behind at any time, and the, the coroner was saying that uh, Kennedy was shot in the uh, back of the head. Um, and uh, it's just... 
clear again, like with the JFK case, that the, the end story is written first. They had to come to the conclusion somehow that there was no conspiracy, um, that this one person, this nuts, had acted alone. And I just wonder if that somehow was supposed to make the rest of society feel safe, that somebody, one person, acted off, and got this person, they're in prison now, or they're dead now, or whatever. And, you know, like, don't sweat it. It's not going to happen again. Or uh, you're safe now. We got the bad guy. When in fact the bad guys are telling us that <laughs> we got the bad guy, it's like they just got away Saran, from again. That's Saran, you know, who actually assassinated Bobby. Um, he had no memory of the incident whatsoever, and it's absolutely amazing. And you know, it's not just Jack and Bobby. You know, there was a long stream of assassinations that took place of world leaders, you know, between the 1960s and 1970s, King Farouk of Saudi Arabia, his nephew murdered him, you know, after being inspired by coming to the United States and being part of an LSD cult. And the people that he was with at the time convinced him that his uncle was the devil and that he needs to kill him. Oh, wow. You know, for exact, for example. So there's a lot of mind control and assassinations where it's right like, like the Manchurian Candidate where they do the crime and don't even remember it. It's just like a cue that they use, you know, snap, snap, you know. But like you said, Saran Saran wasn't even in position to assassinate the guy. So maybe they just mind control and reeled him out and left him like a wet mop, huh? Yeah, I just kind of left him there. Um all by himself and completely clueless. Um, it, it, there's a, a recent book that came out of this by Lisa Peace. Have you heard of it? Well, did you just say Lisa Peace? I haven't heard yeah. of that. Oh, no, she came out with a Ta- wonderful book. Uh, came out late last year, which just a very lengthy and very detailed book about uh, the Ken- Robert Kennedy assassination. Um, just talking about how he was surround was just programmed to the point where um he was programmed not to not to snap out of it until like all the evidence was covered up <laughs> just they just it's amazing what they can do to a person's mind it, it's just um it's upsetting um but things uh things about concentration uh, which I, i'm sure they did to Sirhan. Uh, they're able to focus on things and um, get him to, I, I suppose, trust the person that was feeding him the information. What's confusing about mind control is you, you can't really see it. You can't really feel it. It's just something you have to see play out to believe that it does, in fact, exist. Have you ever heard of the musician um, Daryl Brown? over in UK that's been severely like blackballed and like a lot of his shows have been canceled and he's what's considered a psychological um, illusionist where he's actually has the power to hypnotize somebody to want to carry out an attack on somebody. And he did the show where um, Stephen Fry, you know, the comedian, you know, I think he's yeah. a comedian. I've heard the name. Yeah. He, he was playing a video game and you know, this particular person that's supposed to be the Manchurian candidate and he just falls asleep. And then he just like started sleepwalking to go assassinate Stephen Fry. (laughs) And they gave him a fake gun. They gave him a fake gun, you know, like um, the Joker bang. And then this shoots out, you know, bang, you know, and it's it's absolutely amazing. Like how fragile the human psyche is. And I can really see that with Saran Saran you know, and we talk about how people are just so gullible and complacent, you know, to begin with, and we acknowledge that, you know, we think that people are inherently good and have the um, same capabilities of being knowledgeable as us, but, you know, we might have the same um, amount of neurons, but not necessarily the same amount of connectors, you know, um, to right. connect all the stuff together. And it's amazing, you know, it's, it's, the JFK assassination in this day and age isn't the Pandora out of the box that everybody believes that it was an assassination nowadays. <laughs> I would hope that people would see that uh, or understand that shots were fired from different directions, and uh, if they dig into it enough, they'd see that Oswald didn't do any of the shooting. 
um, evidence was fixed uh, as far as that goes. But that, that's your point about the uh, people being brainwashed. I just wonder if there's any connection, like with what happened with Sirhan. And what we see, it seems like every week now or every month now, there's some horrible shooting going on somewhere. I, I wonder if perhaps some of the, uh, the shooters have been brainwashed. Yeah, you actually touched on a very interesting point. The JFK assassination itself is the first time the media did wall-to-wall coverage on any event where it was like 24 cycle, you know, talking about the assassination. And then when it got to the end of it, it was just like done. You're done. Your job here is done. And it left a lot of researchers to wonder, like, they didn't feel fulfilled, you know, by the media's narrative. Like, for example, they they got a lot of facts, you know, wrong, you know. I think it was Walter Cronkite or the other guy. I don't remember. But uh, he called that um, the assassination, or Oswald was a white separatist, for an example. Mm. Even though Oswald detested the white separatists and he was a communist, you know, allegedly. Um, maybe all that was a cover. Maybe he was a CIA spook to begin with or an agent or asset. Um, I have a lot of questions about that. Did, did you watch the Stephen King um, movie about JFK um, no, starring James that. Franco? Oh, no, no, I heard about it. I heard it kind of took the official theory on, or was you know, adopted the official theory. Is that right? Actually, worse than the official theory, I think it was um, the date of the assassination, which was in 1965. I'm sorry, my brain is drawing a blank on the name of the show, but. It's actually worse than the official theory, like I just said. James Franco um, comes back into the future after changing the time because there is a time traveling like thing, okay. right? Right. And there was uh, JFK concentration camps where JFK put a political dissidence, and they try to say that JFK would turn into like a ruthless baddie, like a dictator, worse than Osama bin Laden sort of thing. And just like um, completely keep people in concentration camps and euthanasia and um, sterilize people, you name it, you know. Um, if, if, if he was into eugenics, you know, like it just doesn't make sense. He was a civil rights activist, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, at least uh Outwardly, um, I I grew up listening to his speeches on uh, what they called the records, vinyl. Uh, my parents had kept a lot of his speeches on uh, records that uh, they had bought, and I would play them, and I just, it just sounded fantastic. I just, that's, so that's the kind of society I want to live in, that, what, what JFK was talking about. Um, Did you ever read Michael Collins Piper, Final Judgment? Hyper final judgment. You know that sounds familiar. Um, final, I would, yeah, I, I would. Yeah, I think I did. It's actually I, very interesting book itself. I mean, like you got Ben Gorion, um, who r- resigned, you know, as prime minister of Israel because of JFK not allowing, you know, Israel to get nuclear weapons. You know, for yes, example, I remember that. Yeah, and. We hear about like this showdown with um, Russia and America, JFK with Khrushchev, you know, and we don't really hear about the showdown between any other um, foreign nations. And even like in the coast to coast circuit, and I hear it a lot with Jesse Ventura, and I love his work. He was the governor of the state I live in, Minnesota. But he thinks that like all conspiracies are kind of in house in the United States and they don't venture outwards, you know, for example, that that's um, a huge hurdle for people. And even in the truth movement to realize that their conspiracies are international itself. And, you know, Israel sure. was definitely involved, you know, with the JFK assassination and, the mob was connected to the secret services in, you know, military agencies, you know, and there was a, there was an interest to collectively assassinate the president, you know, um, for example, he really like despised or organized crime, you know, and organized crime got him elected, you know, he got, uh, um, this mafia figure, you know, 
who got uh, the singer um, who, who did my Sinatra. way, you know, uh, Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. Yeah, he he got Frank Sinatra on all every jukebox in America singing I high hopes. He's uh, got yeah. high <laughs> hopes to, to to get JFK elected, right? Right. A- and he, he got them all every jukebox and to soak in the propaganda. JFK is our guy. And then he turns his back on him and uh, one of the conditions was he wasn't gonna get Bobby, you know as uh attorney general but of course he did and then um bobby wants to play g-man and just lock up organized crime (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's probably why they went after him (laughs) i think his name was uh sam genovana i know i just slaughtered his name Giancana, yay yeah he, he he was the man that brokered that deal to get it on every jukebox. And he's the first man legend has that I don't believe this. He was the first American to be wiretapped in American history. Oh, wow. And, and check this. He was with his mob buddies, you know, in a back smoky room. And he was telling, and he was like lambasking one of his employees, right? You see that mm-hmm. fish on the wall? You know, like that bass with the open mouth. Do you know why he's on the wall? Because he opened his mouth. And he said it like right in front of the mouth. And little did, did he know that, that that bass was where they wiretapped him. <laughs> Ironically. Oh, wow. oh, the no. irony. <laughs> I should have kept my mouth shut. That's what the fish said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Dean, it looks like we got a couple more minutes left. Do you have any uh, closing thoughts before we wrap up this show? And I'm crossing my fingers and my toes that you'll come back on with me. Oh, that'd be wonderful to come back. Sure. It'd be wonderful, really. Um, what it, my last thought really is um, I'm just looking for facts. I mean, that what I, what I do is I just read a ton and I read a ton on a handful of topics and we've gone over uh, most of these this evening, like the JFK, RFK assassinations and 9-11. And I try to discern facts, things that can't be disputed, and there are just not that many facts to go with. It's a complicated issue. Uh, when you go with something like 9-11, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of misinformation. Um, but uh, always willing to hear something new as well. It's something we should all just try to move forward. And uh, eventually, and doesn't happen overnight eventually reach the truth the truth uh in and of itself is a worthy goal uh, even if we can't get other people to see it absolutely great last um statements um for this transmission and dean uh, also this broadcast is your intellectual property where you can put it on youtube or bit shoot or whatever you'd like to do with it it's going to take about six days for richard who's our awesome awesome producer to do all this hard work for us and he, he really does a lot for us and it's tough work you know um own, owning a site and doing all the um tasks and running your own show and making sure that everybody else shows smoothly and hats off to richard for that and Thank you, Richard. You're awesome. Oh, thank you. You're awesome. Thank you for being on my show. And you're, like I said in the beginning, you're one of my favorite working authors, if not my favorite. And um, I'm going to conclude this show, and I'll be back uh, next week with Black Ball to Rolly Quaid right here on revisionmedia.org. And check out Richard's show tomorrow, Arcane Semantics. I check it out every week myself. And I love you guys, and I will be back next week, and I will be with you as much as I can. Have a good night, folks. How to Invent a Religion I always knew you had to be willing to die to even do this job. Can't stop that to come. Executive orders. The creation and the maintenance of a secret government. Within our government. It's a wrong. No With anything. You feel like you won't stand with your grip and face off. There's something wrong with anything. I was so spun. What's the most you ever lost in the coin toss? The law of the jungle. Sir. The most you ever lost in the coin toss. You don't know what you're talking about. That's not good, sir. Hey!
expression of unrest and dissent. Domestic anti-terrorism. I don't have somewhere to put it.